Maseho Maps Mapunyani is a multi-talented South African television presenter, actor, fashion designer, speaker, model, creative consultant, voiceover artist, philanthropist, and business entrepreneur. Known for his charismatic personality, Maps gained recognition in the entertainment industry at a young age. Starting his career as a model and actor, he quickly made a name for himself, securing various campaigns and accolades. With his diverse skill sets and dynamic presence, Mups has become a well-respected figure in the industry, captivating audiences and inspiring the next generation of leaders. I have known Mups since 2009 and I'm very excited to have him on my podcast today. If you want to record a podcast. All right, let's go. <laughs> Mupsy, welcome to Undeniably You. Thank you. Thank you it's so, so much for It's so good to have you me. here. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful day in Cape Town, which apparently has been a while since that's happened. You apparently brought the sunshine I'm with so you. glad. I've been pretty lucky lately wherever I've gone, and it's been sunny and, and like quite beautiful days where they have struggled. So I think I'm going to keep going with this energy. I think it's working right now. I think now. so, but you need to leave Cape Town soon because the rain is coming <laughs> in like two days. So okay. just a heads up. I, I leave tomorrow. Okay, so okay. it'll be good. <laughs> Mapsi, this was, this was difficult for me because obviously I know you so People well. People are going to be convinced that my name is Mapsi. Masejo um, Maps <laughs> Maponyani, born 17th March. Oh, jeez, you got it wrong again. 16th of March is my birthday. Yeah, and I did that on one of my close friends <laughs> has gotten it wrong again. And she vowed never to say it out loud from the last time she got it wrong. And now she took that big leap and got it wrong. I did that oh, on quit. purpose. This is all good. Crickets. Yeah, quick no, save. Gonna, did it on purpose. <laughs> Oh my gosh. For those who don't know the story, Mups has come to most of my birthdays and always remembers my birthday. Um, and I, I, I remember his every year. Um, I was getting a happy birthday the day after. Welcome um, to Whose Podcast Is It Anyway? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this podcast is about being undeniably yourself. And, this is and that me. is undeniably you. <laughs> exactly. This is how, you know, I think from everyone that's been on my podcast, you know me the best. Like, I think no one would pick up on the nuances like yeah. you. <laughs> and Unless your mom's been on the podcast, yes, I can definitely. Uh, you love my mom. I love your mom. I feel like she's like rooting for you, listening to this. Yeah, <laughs> tell her, mom. <laughs> um, what was your I just want to say, actually, yeah. congratulations on the podcast. Thank you. I listened and watched most of the first season. Um, and it's uh, amazing to see how you grew so wonderfully over each episode. I know you are also your own toughest critic, as you know many of us are who want to strive for excellence. And I can see you putting in the work, so well done. Thank you so much. That mm. means so much to me. Also because you've been a huge inspiration to me, knowing you for since grade 11. Yeah. I, your feedback always ma is important to me and so when you gave me feedback on season one you even bought me a book to help me for my birthday mm. and I read it mm. and I think yeah you're a big inspiration for me so a lot of what I'm doing now has come from the times we work together and yeah. that inspiration so yeah. thank you no absolutely it's uh, great to have seen that growth I mean we've known each other now for about 13 years I think 13 years no, so no, more or maybe even 14 yeah somewhere around there but um, yeah, it's 16. amazing to see you. I can after. do that. <laughs> how old are you now, Seth? I'm 31. 31. Okay, yeah. let's go back. Well, how old were you when you were in grade 11? <laughs> okay, guys, quick math lesson. <laughs> I was 17. All oh, right. Now, what's 17? Sorry, 31 minus 17. Yeah, what's 31 minus 17, mums? What is it? It's not 16. 14. There we go. Yeah. All right, let's continue. <laughs> God. <laughs> I'm being called out here. <laughs> I'm actually going to go to my questions now that I, that I put together because we need to get back on track. Right. Um, I, know, I know you super well, but I'm going to ask these questions anyways because I think that there's some things I don't actually know about you. Okay. Um, what was Mapsi like as a child? What was your childhood like? Sorry, Maps. Masejo Maps Maponyani. What was... I feel like as a child, I was always a, I was always super energetic. Um, I 
found myself always wanting to run around and always wanting to be outdoors. I was always loud, but at the same time, a little bit shy, which didn't really make too much sense, but that's because I was a little bit awkward as well. I had a speech impediment. I had quite a severe stutter growing up. So I struggled to, to speak and didn't have too much of a voice in many spaces that I was in, be it with kids or with adults or any environment. And so I think I overcompensated that by just being what was deemed hyperactive, you know, at the time. And, you know, early diagnosis of ADD, running around, which really frustrated my mom because, you know, she didn't really believe in things like that and taking a Ritalin mm -hmm. to try slow me down. But it was just me trying to find my place, find my place wherever I was instead of kind of being made fun of or overlooked because of an inability to have good speech, you know, to be able to talk without stumbling my way through a sentence or sometimes not even making it to the finish line of a sentence. It was, it was quite, a, quite a tough time in that regard. But otherwise, I think I really made f as much as I could um, of my kind of childhood in terms of having as much fun as I could. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of friends and... And I was always, you know, more, more than hyperactive. I think I was always like hyper aware. So I've always been a super hyper aware person from a young age and was always interested in people. And I was that kind of like very sensitive kid as well, where because I grew up so close to my mom and because she studied psychology and she would um, chat to me about psychology, when she'd think I have absolutely no idea what she's speaking about, which was the case for a long time, and I took more interest in it, I would then kind of get quite fascinated by just like human behavior and why we do certain things and body language and all those things interested me from an early age. And, you know, I was quite affectionate as well. And so I was the kind of kid where if I saw someone really sad, you know, I'd go up to them at like six, seven and ask them if everything's okay, like a complete stranger, or give them a hug and my mom would be like, what are you doing? You had a very high EQ. Yeah, I think, I think I've actually always, always had that from, a, from, a, from an early age and I've, yeah, always wanted to be hyper aware because I've thought it's been important to, to be that. I think also because I've always wanted to be aware of my own feelings and have mm -hmm. always been curious as to like why we have certain emotions that I've taken a little, always taken that little extra um, recognition of, of others, if that makes sense. But that makes total sense because I feel that in our friendship too, and with the people around you, I see that with you. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I just, I think I was just, a, a lot of things in one, but more than anything else. And even till this day, my overarching, I think, attribute that has made me the person that I am is curiosity more mm -hmm. than anything else. Curiosity about everything around me, everyone around me. And it's, uh, it lends itself a lot to, to my personality and how I see the world, yeah. So beautiful that you can connect your childhood to who you are now, you know, and pick up those those little nuances that have created the person you are today. You spoke a bit about your your speech impediment. How did you overcome that? I had a speech therapist and we looked at different ways of being able to, you know, kind of help me communicate a little bit better. But without a doubt, more than anything else, it was because of books. I always say, oh. like, books saved my, saved my life. And that's why I'm also just, like, really, really just such a big fan of literature as a whole and linguistics. And I would kind of go back home 
each day after school or whenever I had a gap and read to myself out loud and try and form some sort of rhythm in the sentences that I would speak or read from from the books and would find some sort of comfort and gradual flow with you know each word I would read and each sentence and hopefully be able to then establish a rhythm within my own mind when I try to speak. I think there was always this kind of jam that would happen and um, kind of a clash between my brain and my mouth and it not being able to simultaneously be able to, you know, get whatever I was trying to say out comfortably. So, yeah, I did that for for a long time and eventually gained a relative amount of amount of confidence and eventually was able to get a certain level of comfortable speech out. I use that word comfortable again because it always made me uncomfortable trying to speak, knowing that it would come with a certain level of ridicule and discomfort from others. And it completely changed me when I got that confidence Mm -hmm. that I always lacked from that thing because I, for the longest time, essentially was voiceless, you know, Mm. or my voice didn't really matter much at all in any space. And it really, it really sucks. And it's really hard when you are being pushed aside and are suppressed in any space that you're in, you know, you have your, I was going to say friends, but it's not really a thing that friends would do, but you have your like fellow pupils in school who are making fun of your staccato and making robotic movements when you'd speak and everything. And then you have adults who think they're helping when they hear you speaking or trying to speak. And then what they try and do the whole time is finish your sentences, which is even more frustrating, really. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what I'm trying to say or what I'm about to say. I mean, sometimes I'd get it right, but for most most times it was yeah it was really it was really annoying actually you know because then you're like yeah yeah fine that's it yeah that's it it's almost dismissive in a way it's very dismissive yeah and it's and it's belittling and it shows a very high level of impatience as well and I think that's the kind of thing you know that has been defined to me practicing a certain level of patience, understanding, and knowing the importance of of all of those things. That's incredibly powerful. I think to be able to move through the discomfort, to find that light, you know, and, and work through it at such a young age by yourself to figure that out um, is really powerful and impressive. And I think it's really shaped the person you are today. So... Um, yeah, I, I did not know that about you. Hmm. And um, was this throughout school or did you, was it? I, my f- first stutter, I think, I, st- I started from the first words I spoke pretty mm-hmm. much. And I overcame it around age 11, 12, fully, yeah. How did you deal with the bullying at the time? Not well, and I say not well because... I, in a way, myself became, when I was a little bit younger, became a little bit of of one in retaliation. So, you know, I still would use some sort of bravado to want to stand out or be seen um, or, you know, just, just kind of be, be counted and not feel kind of outcast. What made things even more difficult was being at a school where I was one of like um, one or two people of color, you know, in my grade. Yeah, and so it was really tricky in that regard um, to not act out in a way that, that you wouldn't normally act out, but it was important to be able to like survive in that space you know yeah. I like, can imagine because I also was 
maybe th the third person of color in my school and that was challenging for me but I can only imagine having an additional thing mm. that kids can make fun of you yeah, about. Absolutely. I mean, went there and uh, to a school where, you know, everyone had pretty much everything and anything they wanted. I had come from Soweto um, and I was a minority and there was my speech impediment. So there was a lot of things trying to find my, my place in space, but um, yeah. Wow, incredible. Yeah, all is well. Look at you now. All is well. <laughs> all is well. <laughs> um, so let's touch a bit on your creative journey. When did this creative journey for you start? I think I've always been fascinated by creativity as a whole, fascinated by thinking outside of the box and thinking of things differently. I even remember, you know, while we're still speaking about those days growing up, I remember one of the things that also spurred it on was because I really struggled to find my place with the other kids and I found them like quite annoying early on. I remember going to my parents and saying, all the, all the kids have the latest this and the latest that and these shoes and um, the soccer shirt and these boots and a PlayStation and they always have like all the best stuff. Please, can you never buy me any of that? Really? Uh, because I don't want to be like them. Like mm. it, I just, I think I always would see which way everyone was swimming and wanted to always go against the current, against the stream and go in my own direction. I've never had a problem with that. So I think it helps approaching things with that frame of mind when it comes to creativity because immediately you are heading in a direction that many wouldn't go in and you're immediately needing to think about things differently where you're like, okay, how do I still survive in this space but not do it the way everyone else is doing it? How do I still tackle this problem or tackle, um, yeah. But how do I do it differently? This is challenge, but how do I do it my way or how do yeah. I do it differently? And I think when you are doing that very early on in your life, you're inherently or are always thinking of some sort of creative solutions because that's required of you to be able to, to get to that point. So I, it's a, it's, a, it's an automatic thing. And what's interesting about that is that like, um, I think I'm very, abstract in the way I think of a lot of things um, and I a lot of the time don't you know physically literally translate that creativity into drawing and writing and painting and all of that um, or drawing and painting and writing very much but I look at other ways just to kind of get people's minds going in in, in those different ways so I've always been interested in and the arts as, as a whole and then and, and creativity. And my, my journey has just been to, to always get that out of myself as much as possible and challenge people to think differently about as, things. As a little boy, what did you think you'd be when you, grow, when, when you wanted to grow up? <sighs> I was actually asked this just the other day and it took me back down to that journey where I thought it would be an architect um, or a lawyer more than anything else or an aeronautical engineer. I can um, see all of those, those things, are things too. That I, yeah. But then I, I kind of thought of myself and what I'm like and how you know I can't sit still for too long in one thing. I need to be able to do all sorts of di different kind of things. I think it was my, again, that itching to be able to get as much of myself utilized and out there as possible and my curiosity that took me in a different direction. But more than anything else, happen chance took me in a different direction and circumstance took me in that different direction where I needed to make a plan in my forced gap year because of financial issues to come up with 
with a, a solution of making some sort of money, um, some sort of income. And then I literally fell into entertainment and that wasn't always the plan. And then when it happened, it happened quite well. And quite there was an interesting, there was an interest taken in me. And as you say, it happened quite quickly as well. And I've just kind of grown on from that. Is that when you took a break from school? I, yes, yes. So you took a, what? What led you to take a break from school? Was it during school or was it after school for university? I, I, no, no. So I took a gap year. After so school. So after matric. Yes, yes. So I took a gap year and then only went into varsity um, two years after. And that's matric. when you started auditioning. Yeah, yes. So in that gap year, that's when I got into TV presenting and started auditioning. Um, with modeling and then became um, a PA as well for Lucilla Boyson, yes. the director for SA Fashion Week. Learned a lot in that space too. That's when I was also working at Aka Joe still, you know, kind of doing different jobs on the side to be able to raise enough money to go to university the next year. And then got to varsity the next year and carried on doing those jobs. And one thing has just always kind of built led. on and led to another and managed to do that and finish varsity in you know in um, in pretty pretty fine fashion well done and that was a proud moment for me too being able to balance all of that and and take care of myself prioritizing my education and knowing that I can I can do quite quite a bit um all at once and 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 find that balance for myself do you remember your first gig or your first um casting that you booked like the, the first, first time that yeah, you were yeah, on absolutely. screen yeah um yeah it's it's a super easy one for me i that's what kind of started the entertainment angle so i when i left when i left high school and had to think of ways to be able to make money i knew that i liked people i liked talking i always kind of make the make the joke that when I overcame my stutter, I, you know, always spoke and I haven't shut up since. So, like, I always enjoyed talking and I grew this fascination with articulation and eloquence and language as a whole. And, you know, that excited me and being able to convey certain things that were happening around me to people and... When I overcame it, I also said that I'd always use oratory skill as my superpower. And that's what would monetize my life. And now, you know, everything I do involves speaking. And so I wanted to do something around that too. And a couple of days later, after kind of writing the things down that I thought I could do, I got a call from my schoolmaster, sportsmaster from school, uh, Mr. A.D. Norris. And he said, there's this production company called TVPC Media for Super Sport and um, they are looking for a presenter for a schoolboy rugby show called Classic Clashes and would you mind going for an audition? And I asked him when the audition was and he said it was the following day. And I remember just being like, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, I've got nothing to lose. And I remember spending that entire moment from after he'd, called me um, moments after that, like kind of literally looking at the mirror, making up different possible scenarios of on-field interviews with the rugby coaches and being in studio and speaking to a camera and thinking that there's all these people on the other side listening or watching the show. Did you feel nervous at all? Absolutely. I was shaking in my boots. I mean, I was very, very nervous. And I just kind of went with it and I got the audition and yeah, got the job. And that's when I slowly just started picking up in my career. I had a friend who said, if you're looking to make extra money, then maybe you should try um, modeling. Um, And it's something I was never interested in, but they verbatim said, uh, look, you're okay to look at, so why not give it a shot? So I was like, okay, um, I guess. And I went to different modeling agencies thinking it would just be easy to just like walk in and 
they all rejected me. And then I was like, yeah, this definitely isn't for me. I'm not that guy. I've never been that guy. I've um, always been kind of like nerdy and awkward and, you know, not, not that guy. And a agency um, at the time called Glamosphere took a risk on me and then that led to different auditions and the Fast modeling cover and, of GQ magazine <laughs> and like all sorts of things yeah. started happening. Yeah. And then it was, um, as I said, fashion week, getting a lot of experience there or walking in different fashion shows. Then you were, GQ best dressed man. Then, um, Cosmo happened and then honestly just lots of things just started coming through and about, yeah, now like 25 to maybe 30 different covers later, um, about 60 or so commercials, I feel lots like of different gonna campaigns. I feel like we prop up all been, your covers cool. of the magazines <laughs> like over here so that everyone can see. I still have the, the you, GQ one. You put in the editors under a lot of pressure here. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're good. <laughs> Um, you mentioned Akajo, and just for the listeners, that's actually where I met Mapsi, Masejo Maps Maponyani. <laughs> and we were uh, in Santon on the sidewalk sale. It was, I remember doing it for work experience, grade 11. And we were standing outside, and Maps was on the left, and I was on the right. And I looked over, and there was the shy, still good looking, but shy. Boy, you you didn't even look at me. You're like awkward looking. side side eye. <coughs> you saying awkward? Uh, awkward what? Awkward looking. Awkward looking. No. And then you came over and asked me for my Facebook, at the time. Smooth. Yeah, super smooth. <laughs> That's how we became friends, grade eleven, and now we're, yeah. Yeah. What did you say? Sixteen years later. <laughs> yeah. No, guys, fourteen years. Fourteen years. <laughs> This doesn't make mathematical sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wrong all this time. The and maths then, been taught us. Um, <laughs> just going back, you know, you were an assistant to Lucilla Boyson for South African Fashion Week. And I was your assistant. Yes. I didn't know you were actually an assistant to someone. So, Which is probably why I, I made me. it so <laughs> kind of... I made the standard so high that was required of you because I had been a PA myself and mm. it was, it's not, a, it's not an easy job, <clears throat> but it's a very precise job that needs to be, that needs to be done. And yeah, Saf was my PA a external few years ago. Hard drive. <laughs> my external hard drive was how I affectionately um, refer to her. And... Yeah. I was not great. <laughs> I was the worst, try, the worst PA known. Try, try try having terabytes of files that needed to go into an external hard drive, but external hard drive's capacity to do all these things. So maybe like 250 megs <laughs> all kept crashing, you know? Um, no, but yeah, I mean, you also quickly realized that that wasn't for you, which is totally fair, but... I think, you know, more than anything else, it was a tough time that you were going through and I needed a little bit of assistance, but it was also a great solution to be able to give you something to look forward to doing each day to get you going again. Um, you just come back from, was it Spain, Spain at the time? Yeah, I lived in Spain. You just for come a year. back from Spain and you were lost. I didn't want to use that word, but you're very lost in yeah. where you kind of were and wanted to get your bearings right and you needed to make an income. And that's really how it started. Yeah. Not so much me saying, you seem like you'd be a great PA. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's, let's make yeah. you a PA and let's get you some sort of income. So, and I'm super grateful. I realized it wasn't, wasn't the thing. We won't go into examples of how that would... I think we should give... I mean, it's undeniably you. Like, people should know how terrible I actually was. <laughs> You know, like, for real, I was not great, guys. I was... Well, I mean, I mean the, the a, small, a small example, and I'll keep it very light, was, uh, I don't know how, but um, Saf would book appointments that a client would make and she would be said what day, what time, and she'd 
book her in a completely different day and different time. And I'd call her saying, the client's calling me, asking me where I am, but my diary says this is happening tomorrow at, let's say, 10 a.m. And she'd say, yeah, actually, it is tomorrow. <laughs> and then it's like, what? So why is it in? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why I put it there. I know. And that was something that wasn't happen. That sorry, that that was something that didn't happen only once, but happened a couple times, and yeah. all sorts of different things. And I think what was quite interesting was how we even ended up parting. Is that Seth and I were just like chilling one day, and then she was like, "Yeah, Mapsy, yeah, I don't want to make things worse. I don't <laughs> think this is this is." And I'm like, "Yeah." Thank you. But I also think it's Cla- Claudia Henkel came up to us and Maslow, and then the whole Miss South Africa thing happened. Yes. And then I was like, bye. <laughs> Don't make things worse. Okay, I'm making it worse. But <laughs> honestly, in, 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 in all honesty, I think I've I learned so much from that experience. I think, it, firstly, you were very inspiring to me. Um, I mean, your days were super long from around 6 a.m. in the morning until two, three sometimes because you had commitments that you needed to go to and experiencing that with you, even though I, you know, I was still... S- two, three a.m., just so we're clear. It's not like p.m. Guys, it was from 6 a.m. to two or three a.m. the yeah. next morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned a lot of skills from that. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, now if you look at the way I schedule my things, it's a lot more... You got some cool gigs from that too, right? Crickets. <laughs> Did I? So, so Saf would go to an event with me and, you know, PA's role would be to <laughs> kind of make sure that you meet the right people, we get certain details, we make certain engagements. and I wouldn't even remember um, the person's name. <laughs> and apart from not remembering people's names, Saf would disappear for a while. She'd come looking amazing. Um, which would also confuse people. Like, wait, is that your date or your PA? Or? Yeah, everyone thought we were dating. <laughs> everyone thought we were dating. And she'd time. come back and say, oh my gosh, you won't believe it. I just got a really cool casting. I just met so-and-so and they want me to be their ambassador for this. I just met so-and-so and they want me to do this for them. And I'd be like, Seth, you're amazing and you can do these things, but you probably shouldn't be doing it while you need to go and work and get me to meet certain people and tell me who's here. And honestly, I was happy for you either way. Honestly, worst PA, let's put it that way. But I mean, it just wasn't a strong But I think I think your your intention of like getting me out of my space, I think that intention really worked because that's exactly it, what 100%, I was doing. hundred percent, I got you going you know? again, yeah. Um, just for the bigger purpose here, I never got any castings or anything out of that. The only thing that I got was when Claudia Henkel came up to me and we spoke about Miss South Africa. My first casting actually was after Miss South Africa for Coca-Cola. First edition. It's the first one you booked though. No, first edition, first booking. Okay. Yeah. Just so we clear. (laughs) Love you, (laughs) boo-boo. Um, but what I was saying is you are an incredible hard worker and that inspires me a lot. Um, like I said, from morning to evening. And what I also liked is you never said no to opportunities. That's also something I've learned from you is any opportunity that came your way during that time, you would say yes and you would go for it. How do you manage your time maps? By saying no to most opportunities. Now. Yeah. But back um, then you said <laughs> yes to everything. I guess when you were growing and building. Look, I think I think <clears throat> to kind of rectify that, I think back then still trying to kind of build a name and reputation and everything, I'd say no to I'd say yes to a a lot of opportunities because it was important to start building these relationships. Um, and keep building as many as I could. But it still then needed to be the right opportunities. Now I'm in a very kind of fortunate position where there just isn't enough time with everything that's coming in, and I'm really grateful that I've managed to maintain a relative amount of you know interest and get to work with amazing people, amazing brands, amazing um, events and uh, awards and shows and all sorts of things. And... I'll say no to most things because they just don't align with where I'm trying to go and growth is important in that regard and authenticity is important and um, it's really important to me not to kind of 
lie to myself, let alone my audience. I need to believe myself in what I'm about to do. And, you know, if it's a brand, I need to believe that it's a product that I know I would leave my home to go and purchase and use my, you know, hard-earned money to spend on. And if I don't believe myself, then no one else is going to believe me in that, right? So it's it's just like more important that like my alignment is a a full and true authentic commitment and I do the things that I know I can manage the time within and in terms of time management I schedule things really well and precisely I ensure that you know kind of all flows together I'll get good teams around my different projects um, be it one of my businesses or you know even if it's me doing a show make sure that everything's planned for and that the time's planned for and on things that are a little bit more unpredictable um, have a little bit of a of a buffer on either side but I make sure that I really really use as much of of of, of the day I can squeeze out as much as possible a lot of people have you know five-year, ten-year goals, and that's an important thing to do, you know, to have some sort of focus and working towards something. But for me, what's helped me manage my time better and build, I guess, a little bit quicker on what I'm trying to build is, as I say, making the most of kind of each day when I said, like, stretching out the mm-hmm. day as much as possible or squeezing out the day as much as possible. So... I'll kind of start a day and approach a day and want to see how much I can get out of that day as I can. You know, what's the most I can get out of that day? And that then builds up a beautiful cascade of those things getting knocked off a whole lot quicker than you saying, I'm wanting to work towards this one thing or these two things in five years. And then doing just the right amount of work it takes to, to, get there. to get there. But you could do so much more. You could get so much more out of yourself and, and extract so much more potential from yourself if you kind of wanted to just be as, I guess, productive with good balance but get the most out of each day instead that moves you towards whatever those things might be. So I think for me it's, it's more that and, and really being focused on each task that I'm doing at each moment and although there's lots of different tasks when I am doing that task I try and lock in as much as possible 100% there and present with it yeah yeah okay so you've had the opportunity to work on both local and international films TV series commercials yes what which one has stood out for you the most and which was the most um, yeah which was the most significant milestone for you Oof, it's a good question. They've all. Thank you. I wrote the questions myself. <laughs> <laughs> they've all they've all aided in in my growth in some way, and I've had amazing experiences across different ones. In fact, it's a lot of the time the bigger, more glamorous ones that have been less fulfill fulfilling or enjoyable or interesting. Um not what you would think, you know, because a lot of the time, just like the way when you travel, well, when I travel, um, for me, the people make a place. 100%. Um, when I do anything, whether I'm on any set or production or whatever, the people make that too. It's really important that you are able to do those things with incredible people and when I say incredible I mean just like good kind people people who consciously practice that and do it so much that it's an unconscious act of theirs that to me makes them incredible Mm -hmm. and that creates a beautiful environment that you want to work in so yeah it's I've had a, a, a lot of just like really special ones but I'd probably say from that point of view, the first film I did, which was a local film called Tommy Sweet Something, um, because Akin Omotoso, our director, was 
or is an incredibly kind person. And he was just so amazing and taking me under his wing then. And he does everything with so much care. And he built this environment on set and this production team where everyone was just so focused on creating an amazing product where everyone is so focused on wanting to do their absolute best, which would then collectively in turn create us in making something that was going to be of great quality as well. You know, if, mm -hmm. if everyone plays their role, does their part and does that really well, then how can we, how can we fail? You know, that kind of approach. And I learned a lot from, from, from that whole experience with, with how I would always want to be able to experience environments of people around me, which, with which, sorry, with anything that I worked in, whichever thing I worked on. And yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say it's, it's hard to, to say anything else that 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 wasn't that because that really stands out for me and in mm -hmm. the end we've had an amazing relationship he's gone on to do phenomenal things and he's you know making it big in the states right now with amazing movies and um, productions that he's he's filming he just actually um had a great success with the film rise um on disney plus where he did the biography film for Yanis Atetenkumpo, who's, um, who plays for the Milwaukee Bucks. And, you know, to have an honor like that is unbelievable and that kind of undertaking. And he works closely with people like the incredible, like absolutely phenomenal Eva DuVernay. Mm -hmm. um, and to be recognized by her, you know, says a lot about, about him as well. And we, since then, have done more work together. And a couple of months ago, my first film that I executive produced came out with him called Courting Anati. And he directed that. And it's great to have been a part of a production in the beginning that left such an impression on me, with those people leaving such an impression on me that whatever they're a part of, I've always just been like, wanting to support as much as possible mm -hmm. or wanting to be involved in, in any kind of way or just knowing that I immediately just believe in it because they're a part of it. And that is always something that I will remember. If someone is looking to get into that space, like you mentioned, working with people like Akin, how do they go about finding that? I think what's really interesting with that is people are always seeking out shortcuts or think there's like mm. just like one quick way of making it happen but the reality is that there's yeah there's very few other ways to go about it than you know um if you can't get lucky and get some sort of agency to sign you and you can get auditions to get into acting or get into film somehow or be gung-ho enough to go and approach someone in that space to want to shadow them and get, you know, lots of work experience through working with them, then you're kind of left with film school mm -hmm. and, 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 and studying that, be it through, you know, AFTA or, or FITS. And there's very little kind of other avenues to get into that part of the world in terms of like film and, and television yeah. than, than that or just getting very lucky where someone feels like they see something in you because you've been persistent in, you know, putting something out there. The other way which makes the internet just so amazing is that because of the internet, you, there's this wonderful notion that you can kind of be whatever you want to be. So now you can take fate into your own hands and start to put yourself out there as much as possible and put your talent and whatever you're offering might be on display for people to see that someone might be able to willing to take that chance and kind of just say, yeah, come for an audition. I think you might have something. And that has made a lot of careers more than ever now because 
of how closely linked we all are through technology and this digital age and, and the internet. You can see all these amazing talents and you can skip a lot of those 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 avenues, but that's about as close to a shortcut as, as you'll get. Yeah, I think it's the hard work and the consistency, like you mentioned, but also showing up and doing the thing. Yeah. So not talking about it, but actually just showing up every day and working on that. And yeah, absolutely, because... More than anything else, and this is what I approach with everything, is that I'll always be doing as much work as possible on the things and opportunities I'm hoping for so that when they do come, I'm ready for them. Because too many people then get certain opportunities or approach to certain things, but they're not ready for it because they mm -hmm. haven't put in the work. And then they either let it pass by or they give it a shot and it's just not, it's not the right time. So I'd say whatever it is as well that you are working towards too, to just constantly keep showing up for yourself each day and working as much as you can each day on whatever those things might be so that when that opportunity does come, you're ready. There's this kind of notion I always play around with where, you know, when I was a kid, I would always hear adults say it's not what you know it's who you know and I always had an inherent issue with that because um, you know I didn't think it was fair I would ask my parents what if the person who knows a lot doesn't know the right people like will they get that opportunity like it's not fair yeah um, and you know they kind of dismissed that as just being naive and that I would learn that that's just how it is and so I then wanted to have a rebuttal towards that and later on, a few years um, later, kind of thought of an alternative for that, which was if you love what you do, if you are passionate about what you do and you are willing to do the hard work that it requires, then you can change that whole notion from it's not what you know, it's who you know into being the person that the who you know wants to know because you're so damn good at what you do. So that's, that's something to really keep in mind that when, when you are looking for that big break or whatever, kind of also just focus on being damn good at what you do because eventually people just won't be able to ignore you. I love that so much. I think that's really, really good advice for people. And also I like how you've taken something that's being said because a lot of people say that it's mm. who you know. And again, gone against the current of yeah. it, you know, and thinking about it differently to become that person that people want to know. I love that so much. Yeah, because that's a bit of like a, you know, a sad, a sad reality in, my, in, in, in many parts, you mm -hmm. know, that, but it's also develops a really false, a, a false society that you don't really want to take part in. Yeah. Um, but Yeah. Mapsi, a.k.a. Maps, Maseko Makbanyani. <laughs> How do you measure success, personally? What is success to me? Yes. Um, freedom of choice. That's how I measure success. I think, if I think of my family and grandfathers and grandparents as a whole and um, their grandparents and... Um, and and I take a glance at society and I think of black people in society and how the one thing that like you're always striving for, I have always strived for over the years from a very long time ago, mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago, was a certain level of freedom. Once you've acquired that, then freedom of choice is just the great next step of, of success that you're looking for. Because if you can choose your, the place where you want to live, if you can choose what you want to eat, if you can choose the mode of transport you want to take, if you can go on holiday, you know, if you can do all these things, I mean, I can, to give like, more specific examples, like I can choose whether or not I want to eat from 
this restaurant or that restaurant or or not eat at all or I can choose whether I want to sleep outside or camp or be in a house or just you know have shelter or not if I can choose whether I'm going to walk take a bicycle um, a taxi or drive a car if I can choose whether or not I want to go on holiday or not then that's an absolutely beautiful marker of success because for so long you know there wasn't any freedom and more than anything else freedom of choice was just something that was just so far removed and just so out of reach and to be able to achieve that in that kind of like day-to-day life is a is a beautiful thing that has thankfully become relatively attainable and fairly simple that I don't take it for granted and that that feels like my marker of success. Well, <clears throat> I'm so inspired by that. I feel like it's definitely something you've thought about a lot because if someone had to ask me what it looks like, I think when you're starting out doing these things that you want to do in life, you're creating ideas of what success could look like. And just hearing that puts so much in perspective because it's so simple. Yeah. And I think it's really beautiful to change your perspective on what a a normal success story would look like, Mm -hmm. you know? I think think that perspective is important for me because then you you don't get like lost in that rat race of all these things that you don't stop slaving away for Mm -hmm. just to, you know, impress others or impress yourself upon others um, and live a life that is focused on that sole purpose. I think it ends up being, it ends up being something that allows you to, to always practice gratitude no matter what, because you have that around you, you have this ability and and there is an idea for you of what enough can look like. Mm-hmm. I feel like when you're lost in that race of, and you do show this person this and show that person that and impress this person with this and get that person's approval and everything, enough doesn't really exist. Each time you get to this point, there's always so much more you want to go for. And this time, like, there's nothing that ever And you'll is never really be truly happy. And you'll, you'll never, never really get to that satisfied. point. Satisfied. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. And I think it... It um, it put things wonderfully. It puts things, I beg pardon, wonderfully into perspective for me in that regard. That then still allows me to work hard because I love what I do and I'm passionate about it. But it's not so much about needing to do it in a certain way for for others, but doing it in a certain way. For So many different, like, so many advices you can give. And I think I, I'm always... A more personal one from, from you. I know it's... I always, I always, like, I think enjoy, in a bit of a masochistic way, this question because I put myself through pains of always changing it every single time because of something else that just might be top of mind at the time. And I think, I think right now, personally, it would probably be to, to back yourself at the end of the day, because only you know what you're capable of, and you know what you want for yourself, and be prepared to do the work that's required to get yourself there. Um, you know, a lot of people are always hoping for that joint approval from, from, from others to be able to take that step. But it's your responsibility at the end of the day to take that step and not only worry about proving others wrong, that shouldn't be your concern, but you probably surprise yourself and prove yourself wrong with what you're capable of. So 
I'd say, I'd say that's a right now a pretty important thing that that I think about often. I love that. It really resonates with me <clears throat> as well. If there was a person dead or alive that you could have dinner with, who would they be and why? So many. So many again, something that like constantly evolves as you It's me, guys. As it's you me. read more. <laughs> as you read more and learn more and come across different characters. Uh, and when I say characters, I mean like personalities across history and that are living now. Who? I don't know why, because he was a highly problematic figure, but just always interested me how you went about things. Um, probably a... Winston Churchill or Oscar Wilde? Yeah. Why? You can have dinner with both of them. I was just, I was just always fascinated by the way they, their minds, their minds worked. Yeah, I'd probably say one of them, and if not one of them, um, I've always, always loved. Just the, the beautiful, fiery, incredibly, wonderfully challenging Nina Simone. Probably her I feel too. like I've known this about you. Nina Simone's always been your... I just, I just think she's just, I think, just like an amazing figure in, in history and in music and culture. How she just like challenged everyone, mm -hmm. every man, society, and how she always stood out and had this powerful voice. She was an incredible talent, but more than anything else was refuse, was, was, was always refusing to be placed in some sort of box and to be just regarded as just like this woman. In fact, not even regarded, disregarded as just being a woman, just doing music or whatever, um, just being this, female singer. She mm -hmm. was a, considered herself a strong woman that always commanded her place and earned her place and wanted to be recognized as such and was incredibly wise as well. So actually probably over Winston Churchill and Oscar Wilde, Dina Simone. Yeah. Those three together would be amazing to just put in a room to just see wow, what would happen. Wow, that would be quite a, quite a dinner, hey? Yeah. So, entrepreneur, actor, you also have your um, buns out, which we haven't really gotten into. Um, you're a fashion designer, model, tech and, speaker, tech and creative consultant, voiceover artist, philanthropist. Sorry, I had to get my notes because it's a lot. <laughs> I've got an answer and for you. Go for it. Tech, tech entrepreneurship. Uh, that's like a huge interest of mine that I absolutely love. I'm interested in the tech world and really excited about a new fintech company that we've just launched right now, which is a BNPL called Happy Pay. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think is going to make um, pretty cool waves. Can you in, tell us more about, the fintech space. about it? Um, so a BNPL is a buy now, pay later. So you would have seen kind of like, some of the companies that do buy now pay later on e-commerce platforms. And we are an interest-free BNPL that considers itself more of a cash flow management tool more than anything else. We're not interested in indebting um, South Africans. We more want to be able to allow them to extend the life of their, their money and how they manage it, but um, also allowing them to be able to purchase the things that they are needing at certain times, even when they don't have all that money at, at once. So, uh, you know, Happy Pay allows us to be more altruistic and considerate of how the millennial uses their money or manages their money um, and, and does so consciously. And um, we, we kind of, yeah, we, we're, we're a tool that allows them to be able to have a little bit more access um, to, to finance, to be able to purchase more things, I guess. That's incredible. When does this launch? It has, 
it has just launched. We've just kind of soft launched and um, and we have, a, we have a great team behind it. Where can people find out more information? To find, yeah, to find out more information, um, you can go onto our Instagram page and it's Choose Happy Pay. I love that and name too. Everything it's else really is there great. too. Yeah, I think you'll really love the kind of brand identity of it as well. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out and we'll add a link yeah. <laughs> in the bio. And <laughs> how, so what influences your style, Mapsi? Because you have impeccable style. And I also love watching your Instagram videos because you always draw inspiration from South African designers, international designers. And so what inspires your, your own individual style? Probably all sorts of different kinds of A, interests, um, communities, pop culture as a whole. Um, as you said, I love local designers. I'm wearing a few right now. Um, Cal sure. Matthews, which is a great young local designer. I've got a little bit of Matosa there um, coming through. Um, I also am a big fan of, uh, as a brand called Basic Supply, which just makes like really simple um, kind of plimsoll shoes. I, um, yeah, I, I think I just have just fascinated by all sorts of different kinds of um, cultures and I'm, I love fabrication and, um, and, and fit is important in different ways, but I, I dress according to, to mood and all my different inspirations. Um, and I think, weirdly, music is a big part of that. Music and music and culture, I'd say, are two big prominent forces and, and obviously celebrating being, being South African too. So I can never put my kind, of, my kind of style in a box, which I love being mm -hmm. able to be quite... Um, Versatile and diverse. Yeah, quite, quite chameleonic about it. And I can kind of flow into any space from, you know, a bit of like a um, hip hop to punk rock kind of style to something that is a lot more um, norm core, just like super relaxed, free flowing to something that's a little bit more um, chilled, bohemian, whatever it might be. I think I, I just find that through how I'm feeling at the time. And I just, yeah, and I just allow it to, to come together in, in, in that moment. Can we expect a, a fashion line or fashion something from you? Can we expect a fashion line? Yes, 100%. Yes, um, there is something coming soon, and I'm and I'm super excited. Um, working on something with some really cool local creators, and yeah, can't wait to to get it out there. It's more of like a, a streetwear aesthetic, um, which is another kind of um, you know space I'm really really excited and and um, inspired by. So I think people are gonna. I'm gonna love it. It's all about fabrication, quality, fit, and and just ease of style. I'm incredibly excited for this venture of yours. I know how passionate you are about fashion, and I am. I can't wait to purchase some of the stuff and be wearing the the amazing pieces you're going to make. Yeah. And before we we end off, I mean, I could speak to you forever and. Luckily, we have the rest of the day to do that. But for now, um, you mentioned that you are quite an avid reader. And are there any books at the moment that you're reading or books that have made an impact for you? Maybe give us three or four for the listeners to, to keep an eye out for. Jeez, books that have made an impact. I'll just say the first two that come to Comes mind. Comes to your mind. Um, I'm a big um, Chimamande Ngozi Adichie fan, so um, anything by Chimamande I think is amazing. Um, but I loved um, Half Yellow Sun, which is which is a 
yeah, one of my faves, uh, Americana, also one of my faves by her. Um, and then, and then, I mean, I love classics like um, God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. I mentioned Oscar Wilde earlier, big fan of Oscar Wilde, one of my favorites being Picture of Dorian Gray. Just, yeah, lots of, lots of beautiful classics is a, is a, is a big, thing for me. Um, what are you reading at the moment? And then currently, currently, uh, currently I've been like really interested in a lot of like data analysis. So one of my um, favorite reads is something called Factualness by Hans Rosling, who is an incredible um, data analyst. And he sheds a lot of light on lots of misconceptions that humans have as a whole. And um, I can't remember the author, but also reading um, Mindset, a uh, book called Mindset right now, which, is, which has been quite an interesting read. And I'm going through that terrible patch right now where I've got a few books open in yes. different parts. I do that often where you just like the, start and then it depends on your mood that you'll pick up that book and carry on reading. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, look, there's 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 always something I'm I'm picking up and reading and and rereading and you know, I have a lot of have a lot of great favorites and it's funny when I reread something because it's like I've got so many to read. Um why what what why am I even like rereading? <laughs> Um, but yeah, super excited for, for, for all the things that, um, all the different books that, that I've, that I've got lined up right now. And, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to report to you directly on what you should, we should, should check out. Perfect. Yeah. Done. I have enjoyed speaking to you because I feel like getting to know you like this on, in a podcast situation has got, has allowed me to get to know you better. And I think we should do more of these sessions. Mm. I think the point of the podcast is to really just unravel stories and tell stories. And that's what I'm finding really fascinating, getting to know people through storytelling. So thank you for your precious time. I know how busy you are. And to be able to come down to Cape Town to do this for me means so much. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing all the projects you get into. And I can't wait to be clapping on the side. <laughs> so thank you so much, Mapsi. Thank you very much, Seth. Um, yeah, it's great. It's great coming on the show finally. We've been trying to do this for a while, so I'm glad it worked out. And I'm so, so privileged to be able to be here and do this with you. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad I was able to, to be a part of it. So all the best and can't wait to see what you get up to next. Thank you. Looking forward to that fashion line that you're working on, actually. Yes. I know that's going to be amazing. Valley. Yeah. My labels just came through yesterday. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. So we have lots of exciting things in the, the upcoming months. Yeah. And we blow kiss to the camera to end. Are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> This season, we are changing it up. We are shooting at the iconic Bingley Place and Villa Ravensea. These amazing locations are managed by Mikasa Property Management. Mikasa Property Management is a luxury holiday rental management company based in Camps Bay, Cape Town. They give homeowners and landlords in Cape Town freedom by taking all aspects of management off their hands while maximizing their rental property income. 